new for it coming out in this weather. But it's worth it because you are going to be a uh, participant and an observer in a very important debate. And when you leave here, you will really understand the importance of the three R's and the importance of black studies. Will you think that one is more important than the other? That's up to our participants. Uh, and we have two excellent debate participants who are really going to go at it and they're going to help us to understand what black history has done for those of us that are leaders and for those of us that are followers and what the three R's was able to do in order to get us through this society. I want to welcome you, and I um, welcome you to Clark House, because we consider Clark House to be a sacred space. And we welcome the conscious, the nationalists, the believers that struggle will lead us to victory. We, we want those kind of visitors to come into the Dr. John Henry Clark House, because this is what Dr. John Henry Clark wanted. And since 1992, this space has served as the African house of congeniality, I'll say. Uh, we know that um, Clark House is named in honor of Dr. John Henry Clark. And Clark House is here to remind you of your potential as a people, your greatness as a people, your value, and your power as a people. Clark House operates in the spirit of victory. Dr. Clark, Dr. Sanford, and Dr. McIntosh, who is now the chairperson of the Dr. John Henry Clark House, they invite you to join in this effort to keep this house vital and, and alive. And we want you to feel welcome and comfortable and valued and we want to unite with you in efforts to keep Clark House alive and well. And most of you enjoyed a meal downstairs. Well, I don't know of any um, organization that feeds you first, uh, free, they don't charge you anything. I don't think you know of any places either because they don't exist. You know why we do this? Dr. Sanford, the founder of this house, she insisted that we do something above and beyond the average. Mm -hmm. She said she wanted this house to be very special. We wanted, she wanted our people to talk about it and think about it in a very special way. And she said one of the things that we do as a people, and one of the things that have saved us, we're able to break bread together to enjoy a meal together. She said it's very important. And though we are scratching and scrambling and trying our best to raise money, she insists that we continue to serve food. So you can really thank Dr. Adelaide Sanford for that because Betty Dobson said we cannot continue to do this. <laughs> but they voted me down. <laughs> Dr. Sanford has a very interesting history. Do you know when she was about, I think she was about 10 years old, she and her mother, they were traveling through Mississippi. Her mother was a seamstress and her mother uh, was taking some clothes back to Mississippi where she was born to sell to the people in her community. And um, a redneck in, in a, in a, in a um, truck started to harass them. He would drive up close and bump them a little bit, and then he moved back and kept bumping them. And finally, he ran them off the road, ran them into a deep ravine. And she said, when she ended up in that ravine, oh, yeah, Brother D, come in and have a seat and warm up your, you know, voice because we're going to ask you to do something. Um, she said her mother sustained a, a huge gash across her, her forehead. And um, they didn't, it was, it was pitch black. They had no idea where they were or what to do. All of a sudden, off in the distance, they saw these tiny little things of light. And the, they were coming towards them. And she said she could remember how terrified she was to see these specks of light coming towards her. It turned out it was black people from that area who knew that these crackers ran people, black folks, off the road, and so they were prepared to come and rescue them. And she said she made up her mind at that time she was going to spend the rest of her life trying to rescue 
affirm and just uplift black people because of these strangers that came to their to their rescue. She said her mother, because when you were black, you couldn't go to a hospital in Mississippi. So they sent for some hack, some hack doctor, to stitch up her forehead. And they did so without anesthesia. And she said her mother bit her lip until it was bleeding. And her mother said to her, don't you cry. You stand right here beside me, but whatever you do, do not cry. And she said she stood there and watched her mother's head being stitched, but she didn't cry. And she said that her mother told her, these are the things that happen to us now. But in your time, things will be different. Even though her mother was in pain, she was giving her hope. And she was saying to her, things are going to improve. So here at the Dr. John Henry Clark House, we honor Adelaide Sanford for her work, for her determination, for her dedication. First she was a teacher, then she was a principal, then she was a regent, and then she became the um, vice chancellor of the New York State Board of Regents. Only the second person, second black person to hold that position. And... Um, she was the only female. Now, while she was in that position as a vice chancellor, the chancellor resigned. In the over 100 year history of the Board of Regents, when the chancellor resigned, the vice chancellor stepped into the position. But she said, oh, I guess one of those individuals there at the Regents told her, you would make a good regent but you are so unbending in your efforts and the things that you would, that you do. So for that reason, we need a more a more flexible uh, chancellor. In other words, we need a white chancellor. And so they passed over her. Never been done in the history of the Board of Regents. And now the person that's in charge of the Board of Regents is a very, very rich white woman and who has never had a child in a public school. Mm -hmm. And most of them all white folks have never had children mm -hmm. in public schools. But they have oversight over the schools, over the prisons, over the libraries, over the museums. And because of the importance of a region, they don't tell black folks how important a region is. You can go directly to your region and complain, and they would have to do something about it. They meet in Albany. But here's what they do. They don't give you a salary. It's not a salary position. You have to have an office, but they don't give you any money for an office. You need transportation to go to Albany, but they don't give you any money for transportation. So that makes it very difficult for black folks to be regions. But we do have some regions there. I can't speak about them because I don't know whether they're good, bad, or indifferent. The fact that they're there is good as far as I'm concerned, but I'm hoping they're doing something with it. Dr. Sanford is 89 years old, and she has dedicated her entire adult life to educating children and to loving her people and to doing everything she can to uplift and affirm us. She's a wonderful woman. She helps us to keep hope alive. I know Jesse Jackson said this. Uh, I guess he was the first. Uh, it's, a, it's a very powerful, a very powerful little statement, keep hope alive. Now, I've said all this, brothers and sisters, even though we're small in, in size, I know our enthusiasm for what happens here is, is very important and it looms large in your mind. It had to be for you to come out with this snow falling like it is, because anybody step outside their door and see the way the snow is coming down, would run back inside and go to bed or watch TV, something, but you're here. So thankful, and I'm so grateful to you. And I see repeated faces, and that's good too. That lets me know that we're doing the right thing. So, having said all that, I'm gonna ask you to keep hope alive, be generous in your spirit, be generous in your attendance, be generous in your financial gifts, 
and be very attentive to these two brothers that are going to argue vociferously for their particular side. Uh, Basir is balling up his fists. <laughs> so I, 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 but Hank, do not be afraid, because I think you can handle it. <laughs> I'm going to ask uh, one of our board members to come now, uh, because we, are, we always start with libation. Do you have everything ready for the libation? No, I don't. Oh, 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 yes, you do. Yeah, it's here. It's here. Good afternoon. Let's give uh, Sister Dobson a round of applause. She's a cook. She got here uh, smashing stuff and trying to shovel snow and mop and, and plus she's going to give us some words of wisdom. Um, as a quick libation, I would like to know it's Women's History Month. So we do it. I'd like to start with um, Madam C.J. Walker, who was written off as a person. No formal education, Booker T. Washington tried to dog her because she wasn't a good business person, etc. She outdid most of the men in her era. But besides that, they said that she was the first uh, black woman millionaire. That's who she was. But she was the first woman millionaire. And the first one had this huge house on the Hudson. One of the main people to do that, she moved ahead. We must honor, it's women's history, we must honor Ashe. We also had. It's oh, here. Some water, too? Well, oh, okay. I can't do that. I just okay. got two hands. Okay, I need for all right. You go do the. All right. Okay. All right. What we got here? I like this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having <laughs> Women's History Month. So everybody gets involved. <laughs> all right. I would also like to go to a brother, Dr. Benjamin Mays, who used to be the president of Morehouse College when uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Martin Luther King was there. And um, he used to say, when it dealt with education, that uh, you had to move forward all the time, and you must be looking for success and not failure. Don't bend yourself on failure. I share. I share. We also have Steve Biko from South Africa, a young freedom fighter who died in the cause as he was fighting for freedom from the oppressors, and he used to say, the greatest weapon that the oppressor has is the mind the oppressed. And then we had Sister Asiova, a washwoman who never had any formal education, gave an entire life savings of $50,000. Most Negroes don't do that. $50,000 to the school. And one of the representatives of the school asked, why did you give all the money to the university? Why didn't you do something for yourself? And the response was, I just did. That's all we want. Thank you for listening to my little what was her name? rap. Osceola. 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 Can you have the last name? All right? Ashe, thank you. Oh, let me just say one other quick thing. We remember we were supposed to have this cultural trip to Washington, D.C. last month in February. Well, they snowed us out, or under, or something. <laughs> and they postponed it to March the 14th, which is a Saturday, instead of a weekday. And we put it back to 8 a.m. instead of 7 a.m. Because I usually leave Negroes, I want you to know that. So we're giving them an hour more time on a Saturday on the 8th, or on the 14th of uh, March. And I'll give you some additional visits on that. Thank you, uh, Sister Dobson. And thank you, Michael. Yes, thank you. I don't think you applaud after um, uh, libation. No, no, no. 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 Uh, we have uh, Dr. Calfani from Newark. Um, he is going to be uh, one, uh, he will be joined with Dr. Jeffries, who's lost out there in the wilderness. Uh, his wife was trying to find him. Um, 
thing she found. But anyhow, Dr. Kalfani and Dr. Jeffries will be bringing the unifying statement at the end of uh, this uh, fierce debate. So, brothers and sisters, I'm going to um, ask <coughs> Brother John to toss a coin here. Heads is Brother Basir. Tails is Brother Basir. <laughs> <laughs> Brother Bashir, I don't need to toss <laughs> It's my pleasure to welcome this brother to the microphone. We all know him for his work and his professionalism and his dedication to the struggle. Um, doc, uh, I, I almost call him Dr. Basir. He's probably more than a doctor because of the work that he's done in the community for us over many, many years. Um, I've heard that he was a part of the East. I didn't know anything about that. He was a part of the Sauce. That was a school. He was a part of that. And the African festival that all of us know about, Brother Asir is one of the organizers and one of the supporters of it. And he is also an educator. I'd like for you to welcome him to the microphone and let him know that we appreciate him fighting his way through the storm to get here. Put your hands together. Welcome this stalwart brother. This struggle. This Man. I'm going to push this out a little bit. And I don't think I need a microphone. Yes, you do. <laughs> no, you do. To be recorded. Oh. All right. Well, in that instance, I guess what I'm going to do is I'll just put the microphone over here because, you know, people in my family always complain about how loud I am. So in being so loud, I think that all of you are going to really be able to hear me no matter what. Oh, uh, brothers and sisters, you, you know the format. Uh, each uh, presenter has 20 minutes and then a 10 minute uh, rebuttal or summation. And um, they're going to start now. I should have said that before. Well, you know, it's good to see all you people out here coming out in the snow. Uh, you know, I was thinking about uh, in coming in and getting here first. I can't. Come on now. <laughs> I got a, he doesn't need the mic. Yes, oh, but he does. Oh, they have to record. Oh, 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 they got to record. Oh, oh, oh they record. But it's some kind of way where they stay there. You have a... There's no stand. Well, actually, I might have. If you put a... I have a stand. Or if you just put a... Uh, what can you put around it? A uh, handkerchief or scarf or whatever and just lay it there and it won't move. Anyway, let me just get started in, in terms of first some kind of introductory remarks. First of all, in this particular session, I think that 90% of what is going to be talked about, both myself and Professor Williams are going to agree about at least 90% of everything that's going to be said. But, of course, uh, you know, there's some things that need to be highlighted here. And let me just go ahead and deal with some introductory pieces first. The last time I was here in terms of debating was February 1st, and I talked about a problem that we have as a people, and that is that we are impacted by something called Western dichotomous thinking. What is that? These Europeans are always about two aspects, two sides of everything. Either you win or you lose. Things are either good or evil. You're either right or wrong. But that's not the African way. The African way is that we go ahead and we say, well, in terms of your argument, it's right and it's wrong. We know some people, other than some evil white folks, I guess, who are both good and evil. So it's not a matter of, in any instance, being absolutely right or wrong. And we have to be careful about this because too often we end up falling into that particular trap, and I think it's a trap. The next thing is we've been talking about the three R's, and I think we have to expand that. We can't talk about the three R's, we have to talk about at least the four R's. People talk about reading, writing, arithmetic, but then we have to talk about something else. We have to talk about reasoning. 
or term that I used to use when I was back in high school when I, you know, had to impress these white folks all the time. Ratiocination. Oh, boy. <laughs> okay? The idea in terms of reasoning, and part of our problem as a people is that we don't necessarily think critically. Now, while obviously being engaged in Africana studies, black studies, can help us obviously be more critical, that there are some issues very clearly that we have to go ahead and contend with that are not just a matter of that. The issue of education is central to our existence and struggle for liberation. If we go back in history, we go back far and we find out what Africans, it was illegal for you to know how to read and write. Slave master didn't want you to know how to read and write because they in many instances understood that that was a particular weapon that would be used in the process of your liberation. Then, of course, coming forward, we see that there are still many issues in regards to this question of education. But clearly, education is central to our struggle as a people. And we have to continue on in regards to this particular process. In the process of nation building, we need doctors, lawyers, diplomats, we need engineers, we need scientists, and historians. But of course, if we just study Africana studies, in many instances, we're not just going to have all of those particular skills that we need. There's currently also, we have to say, a crisis in the field of Africana studies. And that that particular crisis cannot be addressed by the content of the <coughs> discipline itself. There's something wrong in regards to the miseducation of some people who have ended up in leadership positions in Africana studies. They've been miseducated. And being miseducated, it plays itself out very, very strangely in regards to this field. The field is in crisis. In many instances, we find it in many institutions. We see right City College. We've gone from having an esteemed department to a program diminished. Why has that happened? How has that happened? And unfortunately, one of the issues is that our people always play some kind of hand in regards to doing some things which I guess we have to say are kind of traitorous. Years ago, we used to say, and it's still true, Chris Rock said it recently and people were like, well, Chris Rock said if you want to hide something from a black man, put it in a book. It was true back then. It's true now. Despite the fact that we have access to all kinds of information, all different kinds of ways, whether we talk about the internet, whether we talk about this burgeoning access to information that we actually have, the fact of the matter is that despite all this information, despite the fact that there is access, that we as a people are not necessarily accessing that critical and crucial information. There are some major historical questions that we have to deal with in regards to education. And these are things that have been argued and talked about over the years. First question is, can Africans be educated? Europeans had doubts as to whether or not we had any kind of intellectual capacity. So the question at that particular point was, is it possible for Africans to be educated? The next one, after it found out that, well, they do have intellectual capacity, should Africans be taught? Was there any reason why there needed to be institutions created for them to be educated, for us to be educated? Next, if Africans are taught, what should we teach them? What should they be taught? This is a kind of situation which is, I mean, today when we look at education, it's still a question in terms of what is the nature of the kind of curriculum that needs to be engaged in any kind of school situation. What is it supposed to be? What should 
our children be taught. Then, who should control the education of African people? This is a major question. Uh, at, at this particular point, as we look at public education around the United States, the question is clear. That the great white father, whoever that happens to be, whether it's Bloomberg or de Blasio or Rahm Emanuel or whomever, they need to be in charge of the education. That's what they believe. What are we prepared to do in regards to opposing that particular position? Who should teach African people? One of the things we've seen in the New York City public school system over the last 15 years is a precipitous drop in the number of black and Latino educators. How has that happened? What does that mean? In some instances, especially in regards to Bloomberg and Klein and these people who've been in leadership in New York, in New York City, which has now essentially presented a model for the rest of the nation, they believe that it doesn't make a difference. As a matter of fact, they believe that white people, in many instances, will do a better job at teaching African people than we can actually go ahead and teach ourselves. Finally, in terms of these questions, what should African people themselves, ourselves, do in regards to seeing that we receive a proper education? And one of the questions we have to ask ourselves is, well, what are you willing to do? What are you willing to sacrifice to make sure that our children are not continually miseducated? There were several significant uh, events that took place this week. Chicago Mayor Rahm Emanuel, who spent millions and millions of dollars to be reelected, was forced into a runoff. Mm -hmm. Why was that so? Education was the major issue in regards to why he did not win. If we look back in terms of recent history as far as elections, Adrian Fenty, the mayor of Washington, D.C., was defeated. Why? Because of the question of education in Washington, D.C. Here in New York, Mayor Bill de Blasio, went to Albany to meet with the legislature, and what did he ask for? He asked for permanent mayoral control of public education. Permanent. At this particular point, it's looked at legislation is provided, and every two years it is renewed. De Blasio now, going ahead and being supposedly the liberal white person that we all see, and it's the reason, of course, why he got elected, he goes to Albany and asks for permanent mayoral control. This is, once again, the great white father syndrome, taking the community out of the education of our children and going ahead and saying, we need to be in charge. We know what's best for y'all. Y'all don't know what's happening. Mm -hmm. We are one of the only groups in the world that send our children to an enemy of ours to be educated. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said some years ago, if they don't treat you right, what makes you think they will treat you right? They don't treat you right. What makes you think they will teach you right? He said it then. He meant it. And it's still real today. I mean, it's something that we go ahead and look at. Where are our schools and educational institutions? All groups that we know have their own educational institutions. If you go to Jewish communities, you see that they have their yeshivas, they have schools, whether or not they send their children to school, 
all during the week, or whether they send them for religious education and other education after school on the weekends, they have their own institutions. Where are our educational institutions? Now we know we have churches. We got so many churches, all we got to do is go through Harlem and there's so many churches on each block. You know what? Brooklyn, Queens, churches all over the place. But what are these churches doing other than what they do on Sunday? What are they doing during the rest of the week? What is the question? What is the issue here in regards to why can we not go ahead and develop and support our own institutions? We used to do it. We had to do it. During segregation, it was clear that the only way that Africans were going to be educated is if, in fact, we had our own institutions. There are people who argue that in terms of integration, that integration was, in fact, one of the worst things that happened to us in that it provided a situation in which we would no longer need our own institutions because we would become invested in institutions that were supposed to be for everybody. If we look back in history, we find that people like Frederick Douglass in Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass in Booker T. Washington, Up From Slavery, one of the critical things that they talk about regularly in these two works is the question of education and how important it was for our people to be educated. In each of these particular instances, both Washington and Douglas made it one of their priorities to, once they learn something, to teach it to somebody else. Let me just quote briefly from the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass. The rest of the hands he hired, these consisted of myself, Sandy Jenkins, and Handy Caldwell. Henry and John were quite intelligent, and in a very little while after I went there, I succeeded in creating in them a strong desire to learn how to read. This desire soon sprang up in the others also. They very soon mustered up some old spelling books, and nothing would do but that I must keep a Sabbath school. I agreed to do so and accordingly devoted my Sundays to teaching these, my love fellow slaves, how to read. So there was a commitment, even during the slave period, by some of our folks to go ahead and make sure that our people were educated. Where is that commitment now? We have to call that commitment into serious question. There are two issues I think that we have to address. And this is something that is disturbing, especially to folks like myself and Dr. McIntosh. That is the question of something that's called the achievement gap. That there's this issue that says that blacks, in compared to whites and Asians, score more lowly, are not as educated as do not achieve on the level of these other particular groups. Let me just go ahead and raise something right quickly in regards to this. All right, from a report called Achievement Gaps, put out by the United States Department of Education in 2009. White students, however, had higher scores than black students on average on all assessments. While the nationwide gaps in 2007 were narrower than in previous assessments at both grades 4 and 8 in mathematics and at grade 4 in reading, white students had average scores at least 26 points higher than black students in each subject. Now, the great white father folks who are now attempting to try to control education, 
They try to convince us that the achievement gap <coughs> is closing. But there is information that some of us have which leads us to believe that that so-called achievement gap is actually increasing. Let me give you one metric in regards to that. People like myself and Dr. McIntosh went to special high schools. I went to Bronx High School of Science. McIntosh went, went to Brooklyn Tech. When we went to high school, there were more blacks in Brooklyn Tech and in Bronx High School of Science back then in the 1960s than there are now in 2014. Now how can that be? If the achievement gap is closing, then that would mean that there would be more blacks in these particular institutions. But that is not the case. So we have to look at this situation very, very clearly in regards to attempting to try to find out what is actually going on regarding the question of education. I have to say, uh, I was here at Clark House a couple of years ago talking about, I gave two sessions which were relatively lengthy in regards to the question of African-centered education and what that is. African-centered education is critically important to us. And by African-centered education, what I mean is the idea of no matter what subject we teach, teaching it from our perspective. Not from the perspective of Europeans, not from the perspective of any other people, but from our perspective. Whether we're talking about math, whether we're talking about science, whether we're talking about history, whether we're talking about music, from our perspective. Now that doesn't mean we can't look at other people in other cultures. But what it means is that we do so from our perspective, making us the center of the experience that our children are actually having. Very, very clearly, if we go to schools now, you go to the local junior high school, the local high school, you see that our children are literally talking, speaking with their feet. They are leaving. They are outside the schools. They are not inside the schools. And if you go inside some of these particular institutions, the nature of the education that is taking place there is criminal. It's nothing at this particular point that can lead us to where we as a people have to go. Now this is also interesting when I come back one of the things I think we have to look at is where does the United States stand in education in comparison to other countries around the world? And this is a very, very interesting situation because you would think that the richest country in the world would have the best education system. But that is not the case. Especially when we look at levels K through 12. When we get to higher education, interestingly enough, we find that there are students from all around the world who happen to be coming to our institutions of higher education. But interestingly enough, in regards to these institutions of higher education, we see that our children, that our people, are not necessarily there in the numbers that they need to be. And this is something that has gotten worse and worse. I can tell you, teaching at Queens College, the number of blacks and Latinos in the classes that I have taught over the last 10 years has decreased every year. Now, it's rare that I get a black or Latino student in my classes. And of course, I have to ask the question, well, what the hell am I doing if I'm teaching everybody other than my people? Why am I going ahead and teaching other people? It's a serious situation and one that we as a people have to address. Uh, Brother Basir, thank you for uh, that enlightening uh, presentation. And I know when you come back, 
uh, for the 10 minute summation that you're going to uh, come with some um, solutions or suggestions for solutions. That's what we're kind of looking for. Now, um, Brother Hank, yeah. Professor Hank is champing at the bit. He can't wait to get up here um, to begin slaying um, Brother Basir. But you know, the one thing about it, uh, I think you would agree that uh, Brother Basir said some of the things that you would be saying. Okay, so. And, yeah, it makes your job easier. And so rather than sisters, uh, I just want to give you an idea of how the rest of the program is going to unfold. We're going to have a 20 minute uh, presentation from Professor Hank Williams. And then we're going to have a poet um, to, you know, invigorate us in, in, through, through poetry, Brother D. Um, those of you that was here, last Sunday, you had an idea of what his poetry is like, so, and then we'll come back for the summations, and um, then we'll have the unified statements. So at this particular time, I want you to know that um, since I've known uh, Professor Williams, Hank Williams, I've, I've come to know him as a person who is very caring for young people. As a matter of fact, this past week, he brought about 18 of his students here to Clark House because they'd never had an opportunity to visit a Clark House. They didn't even know Clark's house existed. They didn't know that black folks cared enough about themselves to have a decent place in which to come to, to strategize and to talk and to be friendly with each other. And he brought them here, and I must say that they were uh, extremely interested in what is happening here, and many of them volunteered to become a part of what is going on here. That's who Hank William is, and I ask you to welcome him to the microphone as he presents his Hotep family. Hotep. Thank you, Sister Betty. And before I get started, I'd like to ask uh, permission of the elders to continue. You may. Thank you. So it gives me a lot of pleasure to be here at Clark House this afternoon. And uh, one thing I'll start with is, for those of you who are familiar with jazz, and you know maybe some of you who aren't intimately familiar, you know there's a tradition of sometimes when you have some really accomplished people up in the bandstand, and they're playing seriously. You know, every once in a while, they'll spot, you know, some, they'll have somebody young sitting out there, and, you know, they'll, they'll just ask them to come up and, you know, do a solo or maybe sit in for a song or two. So, you know, I start by saying that because I'm here with Brother Basir, I'm here with Dr. Calfani, uh, Dr. Jeffries, who, you know, Dr. Leonard Jeffries, who was my professor, is coming in later on, so that's a little bit how I feel, so I just start by saying that. Uh, one, I'm really, you know, I'm really, I feel really very privileged to be here, and two, I hope I don't mess up my solo. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, going on from that family, uh, we have a very serious and important topic here today that obviously we all care about and take extremely seriously. And that's the idea of, that's the idea of black studies and how that relates to education in general. And it's a serious topic that, you know, we can't afford to take lightly very now, right now, because we always need to understand that the enemies of black studies have always been out there, and they're still out there, and in fact, you know, they are, in fact, they are even ramping up their rhetoric and assault as we speak. So it's something that we cannot afford to take lightly and cannot slack up on our defense of. And when talking about the issue of black studies, it's important to start with a few definitions and understandings. You know, what do we mean when we talk about black studies? And when I talk about black studies, there's an understanding up front that, number one, we're talking about a legitimate course of study, or as we say in educational settings, discipline, which simply means a coordinated field of study where you look at something 
from a variety of lenses, but you focus on one thing. And we have to understand up front that black studies is no less relevant or rigorous than any of the other fields. It is not as sometimes you'll hear in the news uh, over and over again, usually by people who don't know any better and haven't done the reading and don't even know the literature of the field. It is not victim studies or a feel-good approach to history, although I have to say that learning the history might make you feel good, that's not necessarily the goal. Black studies is a field focused on the global study of people of African descent through a range of different critical lenses. So just as a field of literature, which is you know, what I'm primarily trained in, teaches you to critically an analyze the written word, sociology treats you to do, uh, trains you to do evidence-based analyses of human interactions, or economics trains you to do analytical study of an economy, black studies done right train students to look critically at the world through the lens of African people wherever they are on this planet. And we'll get back to the done right piece later on because that's important and it's not always done right. And as a matter of fact, there are some systemic reasons why it is not always done right. And I do want to spend some time on the next to last point since that's part of what defines black studies from do what Dr. Leonard Jeffries calls Negro studies. And black studies is the act of placing African people at the center of the experience and looking outward through African eyes as opposed to looking at African people simply as a thing you're going to study as opposed to any other thing. You know, you know, today you could take a look at why the price of grain is so high and maybe tomorrow you'll take a look at some black folk and then the next day you'll take a look at something else. And a whole lot of people do operate that way but that's not what black studies is or not what it's supposed to be. And we get a grounding from quite a, f you know, quite a few scholars who have done serious work in this area, uh, even before we'd concretely identified it as a field. Uh, but more recently, you know, maybe one of the, probably one of our canonical texts, actually several of our canonical texts, have been done by the scholar at Temple University, Dr. Malefi Asante. And, you know, one of the big contributions he gets us he leaves us is the definition of Afrocentricity. Uh, Afro and he simply places it as an analytical lens that places African people in the center looking out as we do, you know, as we do our work. And that definition is key and we need to understand that there's struggle over this even inside the field itself. And as incredible as it may sound, they now hire people to teach black studies who don't really even believe in it. They hire people who haven't even, who haven't even read the literature that in some cases they're criticizing or completely opposed to. And, you know, just like anything else, they're, you know, they're in there alone for the ride until some sort of better gig comes along. You know, so until they, so until they actually get that call back that they've been waiting from, from Columbia or Harvard or any of the other distinguished white institutions that give them, didn't give them a look the first time, uh, they're coming around slumming in black studies and we need, to, we need to deal very critically with that. But there are three basic lenses that I teach students to use to understand the world. And that's as a starting point because I deal with some very basic students coming into uh, coming into the college, and I like that because it's actually a lot of fun, and you have students who are very receptive to ideas, and their minds are open, and they're hungry to learn, and that's what despite, that's <coughs> despite what a lot of people would tell you about black and Latino students now. But for starters, I teach them to focus on a few different things, form, content, and context. Form, content, context. And it's actually fairly simple. It gets much more complicated, but you know, we, start, we start at the basics. And form is simply the shape or type of text, event, uh, thing, or happening that you're looking at. Content is simply what it's about. You know, what's the story? Or what's the happening? What's, what are you looking at? And context is probably the, most, probably the most important one, and the one where you can ex really expand on and that's simply the social, political, cultural, biographical, 
or historical circumstances surrounding the analysis that you're doing. And I give my students a very, uh, a much simpler way to understand, uh, to understand context, and we get that from the late great Marvin Gaye, who asked simply, "What's going on?" And that's what context really is. What's going on at the time you're looking at whatever it is that you're looking at? What's going on politically? What's going on socially? What's going on culturally? What's going on around you? And simply placing that as a piece of your analysis. And this is where we come back to the importance of black studies. It gives you a framework for understanding and analyzing the world with a certain amount of clarity. And sometimes if you don't do that, you'll be completely lost. Let's take a concrete, you know, one concrete example. You could do, for instance, you could do all sorts of economic analyses of the process of enslavement of African people by the Europeans. You can look at what's called the, uh, the opportunity cost of the entire process and, you know, put in very simple language, that's whether or not you can make money off the enterprise given the significant costs involved. Since you realize you have to send ships over, you need military outposts in Africa that have to be kept supplied and defended, all that's expensive. You need enough provisions to last the trip back home, and you need to account for shrinkage. You may not be familiar with uh, the term, but you, know, you actually know what it is. That's understanding that you're, gonna, you, uh, you're going to lose some of your product to spoilage, theft, or breakage. Now, from a business point of view, you want to keep that figure as low as possible, but the cost of pushing it to zero offsets the cost of loss. After a certain point, you account for some loss. And if you can get it in the 3% range, you're doing pretty good. Uh, family, in this case, the product was us. The product was African people. So what does all that have to do with black studies? Well, what we just went through is an economic analysis of enslavement. And, you know, honestly, you could, I think you could probably do some very rigorous and very interesting research. Note that we didn't mention people once. Whose point of view is that from? Whose eyes are you looking through when you do that? And you could go through and calculate all that stuff, but black studies wouldn't ask that question. The details aren't very relevant if you're talking about something that's a crime against humanity to begin with and shouldn't even be done. So you miss the entire point with all that analysis. You could have just stopped at the asking of the question and moved on from there. Or you could simply look at the analysis that Toni Morrison does in the novel Beloved. In it, the character Seedy kills her baby Beloved to save her from the horrors of enslavement. Beloved returns as a ghost and asks the question, Mommy, why did you kill me? Seedy replies, Baby, you can't see what I've seen. I love you so much that I would not let them do to you what they did to me. Placing African people in the center of our analysis family, looking out through African eyes, not the eyes of the European. It gives you a different sense of, it gives you a different sense of clarity and a different, you know, a different mode of uh, framework so you can understand. I'll give you one more example. Several years ago I was at a literature conference up in Connecticut and the keynote speaker, caught up in the enthusiasm of the moment, said, thank God for the British Empire. Because without them, the English language would not be so widespread and we wouldn't have all this great literature that come out of it. Family, I cannot make this stuff up. <laughs> now, it so happens that my mother was with me that day and I pretty much had to sit on her to keep her from jumping up out of her seat. Uh, for those who don't know, my mom was born in Jamaica before independence. She grew up uh, as what they call a British subject. That means you're under British rule and they can subject you to whatever they want. Uh, it, and it basically means the British get the better end of the deal. Uh, we also call it colonialism. But my mother has no love for the British as a result of that experience. And fortunately, somebody, 
pointed all that out to the speaker before they got to my mom, which was probably a good thing because she would have hurt some she would have hurt some people's feelings that day. But it brings us back to the question of agency and worldview again. Within a black studies paradigm, you wouldn't even ask that question. So black studies gives you the context to make sense of the form and the content that you are trying to analyze and understand and get grips on. So that's one piece of the puzzle. But the other very important piece is that black studies affirmatively looks toward not just analyzing the world, but the social responsibility to change it. Can take a, take a look at another case very quickly. We're right next door to the City College of New York right now. It has New York City's only public college of architecture and engineering, and now has a school of biomedical education that they're actually going to expand into a full medical school. City College also had the largest department of black studies back in the early 1990s, enrolling more students in courses than anybody else. That's right, you know, Little City College of New York. So think about that. For the big goal of open admissions was not just to get black and Latino students in the doors, which it was, but it was to remake the university you know, in the mold of something that actually would be an African and Taino-centered institution. So it would actually not just enroll and teach the, the, the students of New York City, but it would teach them from a culturally-centered point of view based on the people who were there. So let's think about that for a moment. Who here remembers Hurricane Katrina? <laughs> What do you think a team of highly trained African-centered engineers and architects would have done after the flooding? Family, who remembers the Haitian earthquake? What do you think a team of African-centered engineers, architects, and medical <coughs> interns could have done there? So that's the potential that we're talking about. In addition to the ability to understand context and focus, black studies begins to develop power. And that's a key point that we sometimes take too lightly, because in educational settings, power means taking up space. And you need to deal very concretely with that. If you don't take up space in libraries, if you don't take up your space in hiring and tenuring faculty members, if you don't take up space in providing courses, I guarantee you someone else will. And the people who take up that space may very likely not have your best interests or the interests of your community or the interests of your students at heart. So the power of black studies is also to develop African-centered focus among everyone that it touches and enable people to see and analyze the world through whatever work they do inside or outside the community. Howard University professor Dr. Greg Kamathi Carr reminds us that an essential component of black studies is the connection to the black radical tradition. In his essay, What Black Studies Is Not, Carr writes that the challenge for African intellectual work and workers remains the same as that for all knowledge work and workers, to ask and answer the fundamental questions of human existence and to leverage answers by drawing first on the most familiar, richest, and most accessible deep well of human experience namely the one native to the cultural arc, out of which one emerges as a human being and as a, and as a custodian to the received inscriptions of the group as a representative thinker. So what we get from this is why we're all here today, uh, which rebelling against Eurocentric capitalist ideas that knowledge should be a commodity for sale or something hoarded by those privileged enough to have it, is anathema, but instead should be seen as something that turns those who have it into community resources with the responsibility to share what they have, particularly, particularly with those who have not had the opportunities that they have. And indeed, the late great Africana scholar Dr. John Henry Clark reminds us that history is a clock that people use to tell their political and cultural time of day. 
Clark said, it is a compass that they use to find themselves on the map of human geography. It tells them where they are, but more importantly, what they must be. So in thinking about, thinking about all, of this, uh, all of this today, family, and what we've, what we've talked about and what we're going to talk about, we should look at black studies knowledge as the hands on that clock that help us, that help orient us and help us see, interpret, and change the world with clarity and purpose. We should look, look at black studies in the words of uh, Dr. Jacob Carruthers as intellectual warfare. That girds, us for, that girds us for the battlefield and gives us ammunition to go out and do the work that we need to do. Thank you, Professor Williams. Uh, you are a strong proponent for African studies. Yeah, two minutes left. Oh, and he was gracious enough to see uh, two, two minutes. Isn't that wonderful? Kind of unusual, too. Those of you that were here uh, with us last Sunday, we had uh, a poet in our presence, and uh, Brother D, and he regaled us with how you want to get the black, make the black nation rise. But he said that's not the only poem that he knows, and whenever Dr. McIntosh sees him, he asked him to recite, recite that particular poem. But I said, Brother D, today is your day. You can recite any poem that you want. And following Brother D, Dr. McIntosh will come to you. He's here now. He was able to brave the storm and get here. So welcome to the microphone. Let's give a warm round of applause to Brother D. We'll pass these out for you. I don't like the mic. You're not touching it, you're just talking. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to touch it. You. You, you yeah, like but I like to be able to move around. And you can move around there. I, I can move around right here. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> this is another old piece first done in the 70s. It's called The Task. What is our role? What is our task? Don't know who to ask. We're progressing very slow, unsure which way to go. Things looking better but getting worse. Our revolution needs a nurse to raise it up from a spark and create a new reality for black people. Thought of freedom but a seed. Long-range plan is what we need. Ideology based on self. Plans not based on someone else. You must postulate a philosophy of your own if you are to find a way out, said Marcus Garvey, and without a doubt, that's for real. Don't heed these words, and you will see, and watch the others living free because of a path that you'll help pave. To the world, you'll remain a slave. No, let's use our knowledge and skills for black self. But what should we do, still we ask, as black theoreticians go to the task of providing us with a master plan? Should we wait or take a stand, but don't stand still? We've always fought. As I bear in mind what Nkrumah taught regarding how revolutions brought, I learned to think as a man of action and to act as a man of thought. We want good, strong people. We want no less. Go amongst the mass and spread righteousness through the farthest space and the largest range. Herald the message of the necessity for change and freedom by any means necessary. Yeah. If you want 
I know the truth, and that's a fact. Let me hear you say, and you know that. And you know that. You did it, did we die, we're so socialized. And how we gonna make the black nation rise? While we party down, yo, and shock the house. Get down, rock, shock the house. The Ku Klux Klan is on the loose. Training their kids in machine gun use. And we can't brag, and we can't boast. Producing new bread and butter for our breakfast toast. Look at all the things that would prove the point. Sisters in the discos, brothers in the joint. Why you dippy dippy dies and so socialized? How you gonna make the black nation rise? You dippy dippy dies and so socialized. How you gonna make the black nation rise? The people call me Brother D, and I'm here to shed some light. To bring the truth right on down to earth from where it once was out of sight, what? Before I continue, just let me say, this is not my ego suit. I sat down and thought, and I wrote this verse in the interest of the group. Come on, my people, people, can't you see what's really going on? Unemployment's high, the housing's bad, and the schools are teaching wrong. Catching from the water, pollution in the air, but you're partying hard like you just don't care. Wake up, y'all, you know that ain't right, because that hurts everybody, black or white. Winter's cold, can't get no heat, just move your body to the beat while they take us on a disco ride, get high and chill, you're classified. How are you acting like the living dead? They talking about the body, talking about the head. Spend time, y'all, to the disco rhyme. Move to the rhythm, but you waste some time. Stop and think, well, do you know it's real? Well, let me educate you to the real deal. The media is telling lies, the devil taking off his disguise, and they're killing us. In the streets, while we pay more for food that's cheap. And all you want to do is so socialize. How you going to make the black nation rise? Remember the so-called Indian? Look what they did to him. Maybe they'll do that to us. They're the struggle. They're the win. I mean, damn. Get out of your seat. We say, damn. Get on your feet. I mean, damn. And I will repeat. We mean, damn, we're tired of your feet. Damn. No more sitting around. We say, damn, it's time for throwing down. Damn. Let's even the score cause we fired up and won't take no more. We fired up, 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 won't take no more. America was understand. Keep going. The story might bring some stomach cramps, like America's got concentration camps. People like Malcolm lived and died. Warning us about genocide. While you partying on, 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 and on, the ovens may be hot by the break of dawn. The party may end one day soon when they round the niggas up in the afternoon. And you start to wonder, are the people dumb? Well, Martin Luther King said we'll overcome, but how? We're gonna make the black nation rise. Well, all you wanna do is dippy 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 die. No, no, brothers, not like that. Gonna rap for the people, tell them where it's at. Elijah showed us how to pull our wealth. Collectively, we must do for self. Don't pay the raw beast who cancels heat. Gave us life fighting for puts a reason to be free while we fight each other without a fear. But fight the system, you never dare. Well, if you ain't down, we'll get you first. Could you show us down just like a curse? By our Holy Spirit, we can't but die. Put a message in our music for our eye and eye. Service for our people, we must redeem. Like Coltrane's horn blowing up supreme. We heard what Marcus Garvey said. And we can't stand still. He said, up, you mighty race, you can accomplish what you will. We're rising up and won't take no more. We're rising up. Won't take no more. We're rising up. Won't take no more. We're rising up. Won't take no more. America was built, understand, by stolen labor on stolen land. Take a second thought as you clap and stare. Can you rock the house from inside the camp while you're moving to the beat to the early light? This country's moving to, moving to the right. Prepare now or get high and wait, cause it ain't no party in a police state. Blessed are we who dare to be free. We gotta change the way we behave. Gotta sacrifice for a righteous cause or remain as passive slaves. We're not anti any other racial group. Just understand we're pro-black. And we're against any one or thing that tries to hold us back. So think, but don't take too long, cause the time is getting late. And DJs, if you got a mic, it's your job to educate. Well, I know my voice is not rated X. Didn't talk about money, didn't talk about sex, didn't talk about clothes or cars and things. And you might be tired of my lecturing. But while we dance, while we sing, all we want to do is ask just one thing. Why you dippy dippy dies and so socialized? Are you going to help the black nation rise? You dippy dippy dies and so socialized? How you going to make the black nation rise? You dippy dippy dies and so socialized? How you going to make the black nation rise? We say, how we going to make the black nation rise? Got to agitate, educate, and organize. How we gonna make the black nation rise? Agitate, educate, organize. How we gonna
gonna make the black nation rise? Educate, 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 organize. We're going to agitate and organize. Agitate, educate, organize. We're going to educate and organize. Agitate, educate, organize. We're going to organize and organize. Agitate, educate, organize. We're going to do what? Organize. Agitate, educate, organize. Mother D is a hip hop pioneer. That's because right. he was one of the first to come out with positive, uplifting hip hop. Yeah. When people yeah. didn't even know what hip hop was. Right. And matter, fact, yeah. matter of fact, the, the East organization in Uhuru Sasa gave me a Black Unity Award in 1983. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> we saw him when he was in high school. He was just a high school kid coming to us back in the day. But, uh, Brothers and sisters, um, Dr. McIntosh is the chairman of the Board for the Education of People of African Ancestry, and we have a father of the Board for the Education of People of African Ancestry, it's Dr. Uh, there he is. Oh, okay. Your wife was looking for you earlier. Did you know that, Dr. J? <laughs> She's not here, so he's talking all bad. If she was here, he'd, he'd be saying, oh, darling, I'm so sorry. <laughs> you know, Dr. McIntosh came over here early to get the heat going because um, it takes a long time to heat this house. So you got to get over here six, seven hours early in order for the heat to come up. So he left his home in the comfort of his home in Brooklyn. He came over and he uh, got the heat going. Um, Dr. McIntosh, as the chairperson, has a, a lot on his shoulders. Um, he is required to advertise what is happening here. He uses social media. Uh, he appears on the radio to try to get, you know, on Gary Bird show and various other shows in order to publicize what's, what we're going to have happening here. And then he participates in these um, discussions himself. As a matter of fact, he is going to be participating in one that no one should miss. He's done research um, that seems to point to the fact that um, Bill Cosby is having uh, difficulty because women who um, are now, you know, 30, 40 years older and their careers are shot, maybe they want to restart them. And so he feels that there's enough evidence to convince you that Bill Cosby is being taken advantage of. Uh, and he has a person who is a feminist, Mary Alice Miller. He is a fi the feminist of feminists. And she believes that... Um, Bill Cosby is as guilty as sin. So, uh, we're going to have this discussion between those two individuals, <coughs> both cemented in their belief, and they're going to be here right here, uh, I believe next week or the following week, uh, for this important... The 15th. The 15th, for this important discussion. Next week is Obama. Oh, next week is Obama. But uh, we'll have people here for Obama, but I, wa I want all the women to be here, especially for this. <laughs> <laughs> uh -oh. It's good to be <laughs> I, I don't know what Bill Cosby did, but I know if he did it 40 years ago, it's not that important. Uh, so, you know, uh, I do know that um, some of those women uh, seem to have some very strange careers. But that's their, that's their discussion. Betty Knox is not getting involved in it. I just wanted you to know that Dr. McIntosh is doing a fantastic job of um, being chairman of this organization. Been, he's been chairman for a couple of years. Breathed new life into it and has us coming here for these debates. Welcome to the microphone, Dr. James McIntosh, chairperson Lord. Greetings, Hotep family. Thank you so much. Uh, the actual
actual topic next uh, on the 15th is, is Bill Cosby being lynched, yes or no? I believe I have my evidence that he is. And Sister Mary Alice, who's very thorough and is a scholar, I mean, you know, she, she, she's a graduate, not a graduate, but she attended uh, Stuyvesant High School. She's been a writer in the black press here. And she is a feminist. So we want to make it a, a evenly yoked battle, you know what I mean? And we're going to, like all of these debates, none of them are battles. Out of it, a debate is simply a what? It's a pedagogical tool. It's a way to bring the information out with two people that are using their critical uh, thinking skills, and you put it before the people, and the people get information from each presenter. So now, emotions are high on the Bill Cosby thing. If I can't get rid of a third of those cases to almost any person who's listening, what will I do? <laughs> we want to know. I'll do something. <laughs> something, something is pinning. But um, you know, I, I, I didn't want to get sidetracked on that. But believe me, we'll have a lot of discussion. I wrote four articles on it, so people that are interested in some of the articles. I mean, they were saying they, the list just kept getting longer and longer and longer. And I started looking at some of the cases. I looked at one case. Said that Bill Cosby and his wife, they double dated with this other couple. They went out and they came back. The wife, Camille Cosby went to bed. The woman's date went home. And the lady stayed and played pool with Bill. Said at a certain point, he grabbed her roughly and kissed her. And she pulled away. He said, What's wrong? She said, I, I never kissed a black man before. He said, well, was it any different? She said, no. He said, well, it must have been different because you pulled away. He pulled her again, and then she pulled away, and she left. That's it. That's the whole story. When you go, But that number is included. In the, it, I mean, I am flying. It was um, uh, the, the Incredible Hulk's wife, you know, soon-to-be wife. You know, she wasn't his wife yet. I looked at this, I'm saying, well, okay, why do you, if, if let's say you had 29 people, this one clearly ain't one. Why do you say 30? 30 must be important to you. I started looking. Find another case. Woman's in a hotel lobby. Bill Cosby walks up to her, puts his arm around her, says, will you marry me? She smiles. She knows who he is. And... She tells him, you know, she knows who he is, so on and so forth. So he says, will you come to my show tonight? You know, you can come to my show tonight. She says, okay. He says, just go to, the, come to the thing and tell the people that, um, you know, you, you know that I said you could come in and you can come in. She goes, she watches the show. After the show, one of his people comes and says she can come to the dressing room. She goes to the dressing room. The dressing room is crowded with people, filled with people. She waits. Until all the people leave. I said, well, maybe she was waiting for the justice of the peace. I don't know. You know, he can't, you know the man is interested in you because he can't put his arm around you. She says, this is not me. See, I only wanted to make my case on people, what they said. I, I can't add anything into this. I listen to what they said. She says, he then offered her two pills. She says she don't know why she took the two pills, but she took the two pills. <laughs> now, she was probably born at night. Not only at night, probably at last night, you know what I mean. So, but at any rate, she takes the two pills, and she says the next thing she discovers is that, no one of the articles said he told her they were quaaludes. All right, so she took quaaludes. So now, she says that she awoke, not awoke, but, you know, found herself in the middle of having sex with Bill Cosby. And thinking, she, how does she get out of there? Now, some people think that this means he knocked her. No, loot it out. It means that it's just like blacking out with alcohol. You don't pass out. You just have a period in which you're not aware of what your behavior was uh, during that time. So now, that would be, you know, you said, well, you know, because she, she was a younger woman. I mean, she was like around 19, 20 years old. You know, and he's a middle at that time he was a middle-aged guy, because this is all stuff that happened like 30 years ago, right? I think that one happened 39 years ago. 
39 years ago, but we're not finished yet. She says that she leaves, she goes home, and she tells her mother. Now her mother with the wisdom probably from the fact that her mother was a, a resident of Las Vegas, uh, Nevada, you know, at the time, told her, said, well, maybe he'll take care of you. So she goes back. She goes back, she meets him in hotel rooms for two weeks. He gives her money. Then, this is her words, not my words. She says, I told him I thought I was pregnant. And he sent me away. Your rapist had to send you away. This doesn't make any sense. Now, if it makes sense to you, then you know what I'm saying? Now, my opponent is going to win a debate. I just gave you two. I got more. Many a way, he never touched a woman. By the woman's, if I'm lying, I'm flying. There's one woman that said, you know, everybody knew he gave pills and stuff, and said he was back, she was back then. He gave her some pills, and when she woke up, she was in bed with another dude. Bill Cosby ain't touched. She's on that list. They're taking advantage of the fact that you ain't reading the list. They gave two more, five more, three more. Eight more. And you go, oh my goodness, a hundred women. You know, one article said 13 Playboy bunnies. If I'm lying, I'm flying. One of the one article said 13 Playboy. When you read the article, it's one Playboy bunny. Okay, it's one Playboy bunny. So, anyway, I didn't mean to give any uh Betty brought it up, so I just wanted to say, well, what's it what's it based on? What's it based on? It's not based on uh it's not based on me disliking these women or being for it. I was arrested twice in defense of Tawana Broad. I'm saying in the demonstrations around Tawana Broad. I'm against rape. I went out there to a large number of those demonstrations. We, and I know most of y'all didn't. 40 weeks we demonstrated about the Rockaway Five. Right. Carol Taylor, every week we went out there and demonstrated for her. Most of y'all weren't out there. I wrote all the articles that gave the point of view of what happened to the St. John's rapists. They said the St. John's rapists were innocent when all of these boys on the lacrosse, uh, 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 um, uh, uh, what's it called? What's, that? what's the game? Lacrosse team, several of them went state's evidence. They didn't even deny the facts. They didn't say, well, we didn't do it. We weren't there. They said she consented. This Catholic school girl consented to go there and let the, uh, the lacrosse team do all these things to her. I'm not saying anything about women who are sex workers. That's your own choice. But if you're a Playboy bunny, that's a sex worker as far as I'm concerned. If you, I'm, what is it? You have, to, you have to have to teach you to do the bunny stance that you do while you serve these drinks. And, and this, come on. This girl was a Catholic school girl on the rifle team. She goes to the place with one of the members, and he says, wait a minute, I got to do this, that, and the other, gives her a drink, and all that stuff. They said, said those guys were innocent. The chief investigator in that case was the chief invest down here in Queens, was the chief investigator in the case in Wappinger Falls for Tawana Brawley. He was the chief investigator in the case for the Rockaway Five. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. If you tell me that six Black men who say that the same cab, same cop took them to a remote place and at gunpoint sodomized them, and you say it's a conspiracy. They got together because he was giving them a lot of tickets. Imagine that. You're going to say somebody sodomized you because they gave you some tickets. Then if it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander. If you say it's conspiracy, when six separate black men come forward and say this happened, I don't care if you tell me a hundred white women came forward. I go with what Ida Wells Barnett said. Ida Wells Barnett said, in most cases of interracial rape, where men are lynched, she says those men are lynched with the full understanding that the relationship between that woman and that man was clandestine and consensual. It's in the red record. For those of you who don't know, she went around to the, she knows, she took the statistics on these lynchings. What Bill Cosby did, what happened to those women, I don't know. But I know this. 
I know this. That there's no woman that thought Bill Cosby was so powerful that if she didn't come forward, something wasn't going to happen to him. No white woman feels less powerful than a black man. She knows that all she got to do is say, that's the one, that's the one right there. There was a case in New York where the jury, a man is on jury duty. And as they're picking the people for the jury duty, a white woman says, that, that looks like the man that arrested me. Well, he might have got out, but that was after they arrested him. All any of them got to do is take their finger.